takes a glass to the past And the ladies cross the ages Fallen fathers from the motherland Whose lives are on the pages And the father said it best When he told us all the world's a stage So fellas, grab a glass And lift your spirits to the seventh age Welcome, one and all, to the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's time once again to pour up a glass and pull up a chair as we gather together here in our favorite corner of the Cross Time Pub, exploring the riddles of stone and, of course, the signs in the sky observed by the ancients. Joining me, as always, are my colleagues, my friends, my brothers, James Waldo and Jason Pintrail. I'll start with you this time, Waldo. How you doing there, brother? I'm doing pretty well, man. Uh, nothing special to report. Just uh, working from home and, you know, being super bored. Well, you know how the expression goes, no news is good news. Yeah. I've got too much news on my end, so I'm just going to spare you guys the details and we'll just, we'll get right to Jason Pendrail, sir. How are you? Hey, man. Doing good. Uh, school is back in session, so we're on day three as we're recording this and we'll just see how it plays out. We're literally taking it day by day. Weird times for schoolgoers, you know, and I, I almost, you know, I'm always up early. I think you guys know that I'm usually up working at least by 830, but I'm up before that. And I almost sent you a message uh, seeing if I could call real quick before you dropped Ari off at school to tell the little booger, uh, you know, happy day on your first day of school. I know what that was like. I remember what I wore on the first day of school when I was in kindergarten, right? You know, the little book bag I had, the tank top they, they put me in. I mean, so that's an exciting time. And yet for parents, I realize this is a really strange time to be sending your, your wee ones off to schooling. Yeah, there's a lot of things to think about. You know, it's in a way it, it, it takes away the innocence and the fun. You know, he's starting kindergarten and it should be fun. Uh, and adventurous and you know but we're keeping exciting for him we're just trying to stay focused on keeping everybody safe and healthy and literally just taking it one day at a time and uh, just hoping for the best as far as the school year goes Uh, but you know we're on day three and so far so good he's having a great time and I'm seeing all the other parents out there in social media world posting their pictures and we just I think we're all collectively hoping for a good year yeah, worst comes to worst, if they end up having to close the schools, you know, or, or at-home learning starts again, we will just begin the Seven Ages Field School and get him out there in the creeks looking for fossils, looking for actual living biological organisms of the extant variety, and of course, those stoneworked rudiments of the past, the evidences of our forebears who came thousands of years before us here in this portion of the United States. Always lots to learn in that regard. Yeah, absolutely. And he's quickly becoming an expert in all of those fields. So, you know, it would it'd just be like another field adventure for him. He'd love it. Expert, you say. But is he a six string samurai yet? Uh, working on that as well. Yeah. And now my youngest, uh, he's almost two and he's uh, right there on his heel. So anything older brother wants to do, he wants to do. So, uh, yeah, they're they're enjoying the guitars as we uh, watch them very cautiously. Yeah. As they strum the strings. I was about to say, yeah, you make sure that those kids are really careful with those guitars, right? Hey, James, have you had your guitar out recently? Not in a while, actually. Yeah. Mine's been out a lot lately, actually. Oh, I mean, really? Yeah, both of my guitars. I mean, I, I'm in that weird state of mind lately where, I mean, I've been back on the road, you know, and uh, with precautionary measures in mind, everything had kind of opened back up. One of my musician friends a few weeks ago had said, to me actually you know don't worry about the pandemic that's a thing of the past and i'm like yeah not so sure and sure enough just a matter of weeks later and uh, a lot of renewed questions so fully vaccinated though i am i I've, I've got my mask in my hand you know and i'm going into the events and i'm seeing how close everybody's gonna have to be you know if you've got a big stage and you're a distance away from the crowd no big worries but uh yeah i had a show last night let me tell you about this by the way now, normally it's archaeology and geology and, and history on this program, but we've got to talk a little bit about meteorology, ladies and gents, because here in Western North Carolina, it got real last night. I mean, it got real, real. So I knew there was going to be some rain yesterday, and I had to travel about an hour and a half away to Cashiers, North Carolina, a group of West Point graduates. Now, you know, when you hear that, you think, oh, you know, it's going to be a young bunch of kids. You know, these were all folks in their 70s and 80s. I mean. Yeah, 
Yeah, folks who have served us. I think everybody in the room had in some way served the United States uh, during the Vietnam conflict, right? And so it was great to talk with all these folks and hear the stories. You know, I mean, it was it was really interesting. But getting there was the problem. Because I hit the road. I get about 25 minutes. Well, actually, let's start five minutes down the road. Five minutes down the road, I realized I had left the lyric sheet for the military song that they had requested that they wanted to hear, which I was going to bring and sing. Then I go back to my house, get that. Get on down the road, realize I need gas. I'd forgotten to gas up the day before, so I get to the gas station nearest my home, second nearest to my home. The pumps are all shut off because of the extreme storm activity. There was no power, and hence the digital pumps were off. I'm like, okay, interesting. So I'll drive a little further on down the road. Maybe once I get over to Airport Road, I can hit one of those gas stations over there. Before I make it to the gas station... I get an alert on my phone. I hear my phone buzzing, and I'm like, what is, go- what is that noise? And there is a tornado alert, not a warning, a tornado alert. And it is telling me, shelter in place, tornadoes in your area. And I'm like, oh, great, and I'm out driving. Well, I decide, you know, I don't see any funnel clouds, so I'm going to keep my eyes peeled, but I'm going to proceed on up the road to the gas station that I hope I can reach before I run out of gas and made it, managed to fill up, get back on the road in time for the flood warning. Yeah. Now, about the time I see the flood warning, I'm actually traveling through an area of western North Carolina known as Rosman, outside of Brevard. Let me tell you, they weren't kidding about flooding. I mean, the, the creeks, the rivers were overflowing, and I was actually very gradually making my way through areas of roadway that were completely covered by water. Okay. <laughs> Wow. Hope you brought your water wings. Yeah. So, so I make my way on up the mountain and I'm thinking finally that I get to a point or beyond a point, you know, where I'm high enough up the mountain that I'm not going to encounter any more flooding. And then I see a road crew putting up roadblocks and I'm like, great. And so I pull up, I'm like, Hey guys, what's going on? And they said, power lines are down. Great. I'm like, okay, is there a detour? They said, we haven't uh, outlined one yet, but here's what you do. Go up here. So they tell me to go up this road and look for this particular road name, take a right there, and that'll bring you back down on the 64, and you'll be back on course. Well, so I go down this road and up a mountain and onto a dirt road and way back up into the woods, and then it's one lane, and obviously other traffic's being redirected from the other end, so we're all trying to make our way on this one-lane dirt road on this mountain with no guardrail, mind you, and all of this traffic, and it raining cats and dogs and pigs and unicorns, I mean, all hell was breaking loose, ladies and gents. I finally made my way back down to 64. I finally make my way to the destination. The other band members somehow, by a act of God, perhaps, we actually all got there within uh, maybe 10 minutes of start time. And when we walk in, the folks are like, hey, glad you're here. We're ready. We'd hope maybe you guys could start early. And I'm like, yeah. So yeah. most importantly, did the Les Paul and the Martin make it there dry and safe? Well, I didn't take the Les Paul with me, the Martin. It was an acoustic gig, but uh, but we ended up having a great time. And again, you know, it was West Point uh, alumni. And uh, during the break, they were like, you know, after we performed for a while, they wanted us to all come sit down with them, you know, hang out, talking with some of these guys. You know, I mean, all of them in the 80s, some of them are in their 80s, I mean, and they had all worked at the Pentagon, you know, they had all been, you know, deployed, you know, in battle, you know, had served just like, you know, you, James, and of course, you know, mm-hmm. in various other walks of life, uh, other members here present. But uh, yeah, it, it was just fascinating, the stories and everything. But uh, yeah, I finally made it back home last night, hadn't had enough. And then Jason Pendrill, to answer your question, then, sir, yeah, that's when the Les Paul broke out. I just couldn't sleep. I was like, yeah, it's going to be one of those blues nights. And so I just got paid, got me a pocket full of change. By the way, yeah, that's right. yeah, I we'll, think we'll we dedicate should dedicate that one to uh, Dusty. The late, yeah. the great. Yeah, we've lost that that fine bass player carrying the low end for the entire Lone Star State. We lost Dusty Hill of uh, ZZ Top in recent days. So, yeah, we pay a bit of tribute to him with our musical discussion this week. But anyway, enough about me. What's happening in the news there, Jason Pintrail? Well, you know, keeping in theme for uh, this week's episode on uh, Gobekli Tepe with Martin Sweatman, um, great new story came out, very interesting piece called uh, Largest Meteorite Impact Crater on Earth in 100,000 Years Found in China. Uh, this was being reported through the Global Times, and it was published 
uh, on August 5th. So uh, again, keeping with the, the theme for this episode, uh, looking at the potential of the YDE impact, uh, this particular article is talking about uh, this massive uh, meteor crater that's been found in China. It says scientists have found a crescent-shaped meteorite impact crater in northeast China, reportedly the largest meteorite impact crater on Earth in the last 100,000 years. Uh, the finding was published in a research journal article on the scientific journal Meteorics and Planetary Science on July 29th, offered, authored by both uh, Chinese scientists and scientists from the University of Vienna in Austria. Uh, the crater in uh, what's known as the Yilan Crater, it's about 19 kilometers northeast of the town of Yilan um, County, and it's located in a hilly area southeast uh, of the Lesser Xingan Range. Uh, it's one of the best preserved forest areas in China, according to the article. Uh, this particular crater um, is a circular geologic structure. It's 1.85 kilometers in diameter and 579 meters in depth. Wow. Um, it's very well preserved. Only the southern third of the crater rim is missing. And uh, all in all, it's got a maximum elevation above the present crater floor of about 150 uh, meters. So this is important because it's determined so far to be the largest one to impact within the time of, of human beings. So in the last 100,000 years, uh, it definitely would have uh, been an attention getter. And I just thought it was uh, very appropriate for what we're talking about this week. Man, those impact craters are no joke. Waldo, I yeah. bet you got something to say about that. Well, yeah. So that's a pretty pretty good size uh, crater, obviously. Well, I, I read the story here, and I was trying to discern, are they saying that the crater is 100,000 years old, or it's just happened within the last 100,000 years? It was it was, it yeah, was a they, little bit unclear. Yeah, they didn't really uh, exactly explain that, but I, I think the idea was that it being uh, an impact within that time period, but yeah, they don't give an exact date as far as I can tell of, of uh, when they think it actually occurred. Yeah. Um, but interesting nonetheless, <laughs> and certainly a significant site, um, one that, you know, puts all of this in mind as we get into this discussion this, this yeah, year. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the, and the thing about this is, is that's a, such a significant uh, impact crater. I'm sure that it probably would have had some pretty negative effects, you know, globally, um, you know, immediately after that, and maybe, you know, for a couple of years. So there's lots of, that's the thing to kind of remember as we look back through history and you try to correlate, you know, different data points and, and different things that we learn about the past. There's a lot of things that we don't really know uh, that came into, that played into uh, the history of, of the planet and, uh, um, and human beings, especially something like this, it's, you know, within the last hundred thousand years, this would have had an effect on uh, the human population and our, you know, our, our uh, cousins, uh, species and, and pretty much everything else, honestly. Absolutely. And you know, something else that really comes to mind here, I've been doing a lot of research recently into asteroids, comets, and also the, the blurring of the lines between those two things. And an actually tangent to that mysterious phenomena associated with asteroids, bolides, things like this. To give you an example of what I'm talking about, often when people throughout the years, and there's a, an abundance actually of scientific literature that seems to account for these kinds of observations, but when people have seen a meteor or particularly a very bright bolide streaking through the sky, they'll hear it. And they may even hear it first, and that's what draws their attention to it. But in terms of the physics of light and sound, you know, you're going to be able to see that light much sooner than you'll hear the sound. So the sound that this space object is producing as it travels through our atmosphere shouldn't accompany the observation. It should actually arrive a few seconds, maybe even a minute or more later. And yet there's a lot of scientific data that describes people seeing and at the same time hearing fireballs. Now, that's an interesting phenomenon in itself. But when we look at particular annual displays like the Geminids. And of course, those are known to have been associated with the asteroid Phaeton, named after the same character from Greek mythology. We know, of course, that these annual meteor showers emanate from that parent asteroid, but what's really weird about that asteroid is that it seems to behave like a comet. But in its orbit, since it shares an orbit with Mercury, and it goes really close to the sun. I mean, the temperatures, you know, again, I'm spitballing here. I think they get up around 18, 
100 degrees Fahrenheit or something like that. So under that extreme temperature from the sun, that asteroid is going to be heated periodically, I mean annually, and over the you know immense length of time that that asteroid has been in its very predictable orbit. I think it was first uh, observed in the early to mid-1980s, but presumably would have been in its orbit for much longer than that. So that ice would have all been baked off long time ago. Now, what produces a comet's tail, of course, is the ice and, of course, the other, you know, ejecta that is propelled away from the space object as it passes through space. And sometimes, I mean, those cometary tails can be maybe, I mean, millions of miles long, depending on the location of the asteroid. Yeah, I think that's a lot of, I think the the, uh, solar wind uh, ionizes uh, the material of the comet itself, and it kind of creates this ionized gas uh, uh, halo around it and leaves that long tail, you know, as we know, as a broom star. That's right. Yeah, that's another aspect of it, too. But now when you don't have ice and you don't have other kinds of physical properties that should produce that comet-like effect, again, some asteroids, even the mysterious Oumuamua back in 2017, seemed to have certain characteristics that were asteroid-like, and so, or rather comet-like. And so a lot of astronomers have been looking at, well, you know, again, are there things that might account for comet-like behavior by asteroids. Now, the reason I bring this up, of course, is because one of the recent theories about Phaeton has the has to do with the idea that sodium is baked off when it goes close to the sun, but that as that sodium is being baked off, that this may actually eject particulates from the asteroid, which may contribute to uh, new arrivals, we might say, during the December Geminids. And so over time, it's interesting how those dynamics might contribute to future potential impact events if there's a large enough space object that could actually strike the Earth. So, I mean, again, it's fascinating to me, the interdisciplinary aspect of all this, looking at the history, the geology, the, you know, the uh, celestial side of all this and the astronomical considerations. So much to consider. Very exciting and potentially scary subjects, all of them. And so when we look at Gobekli Tepe here in just a bit with Martin Sweatman, our esteemed guest, I want to get his perspective on all of this and much more. Before we do that, though, I think it's about time, Jason, for us to check in with our friends over there at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room. Yeah, well, again, Chase Chase is getting back from a uh, big trip out west. You know, he's wrapping up his summertime trip he does with his son Isaac every year. And uh, I think he's settled back home in Tennessee, but preparing to hit the road again because he's never still for long. I think he's heading back to Colorado this time. Uh, but, yeah, they've uh, got some new material out over there at the uh, Smoky Mountain Relic Room. So, again, uh, like we said last time, it has been expanded. It's much bigger now. They've got a lot more uh, displays, a lot more cases, a lot more things for you to go and see, especially with the holidays coming up. Great place to stop off and pick up some very unique gifts for your family members. Um, on the educational side of things, Chase and History YouTube channel is always putting out uh, great new videos. Uh, pop over there and check them out. There's always something new to learn, something exciting, and guaranteed content that you're not going to get anywhere else. Over on the podcast, they got new episodes on dinosaurs, Summer Digs, and Teddy Roosevelt. And just today, I heard a brand new interview Chase did with our uh, Seven Ages alumni, David Dean, who is a great, great uh, avocational archaeologist there in East Tennessee, but really more on the professional level. He is so skilled, a lifetime worth of uh, hard work out there in the field, just a great, great guy, and a really fascinating new interview with David Dean. Yeah, in fact, he's actually served as an educator for a number of years. He's even taught at many of the community colleges. David was very kind to sit down with you and I, Jason, there at the Smoky Mountain Relic Room at an event we attended Great guy, wonderful authority, really knows Tennessee archaeology almost unlike anybody that I've met. Yeah, and even again, after we did the interview with him, this interview, I learned that much more about uh, the things he's done in his life. He really should write a book about not only typologies, which is one that he's working on right now, the Projectile Point series of East Tennessee. He needs to write one about his own life because the guy is fascinating. Yeah. Uh, but again, Chase does an excellent interview with David Dean over there on Chasing History Radio. Uh, and again, this uh, episode is brought to you by, by our sponsor. It is the Smoky Mountain uh, Relic Room within the Smoky Mountain Knife, work, knife Works. That's going to be at 2320 Winfield Dunn Parkway, Sevierville, Tennessee. And you can always find them online at therelicroom.com. That's therelicroom.com. Good friends of ours and, of course, proud sponsors of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. They've got everything there. I mean, they've got all kinds of historical objects. They've got 
you know, fossils, they've got minerals, they've got books, who knows, maybe in the future, they'll carry books authored by team members right here, part of the Seven Ages research team. And of course, Chase is a good friend. We love to get out there and spend time with him. He's one of our favorite people, and we hope everybody can share in some of that, that wonderful energy that he gives off. So go out and check him out if you're out that way. Lots to see, great people, good times to be had by all. You know, I'll tell you what's a good time is reading those reviews. A lot of you guys out there continue to show some serious love for Seven Ages. Surely we've got at least one review to share this week, huh? Yeah, well, we've actually got three, but oh. uh, in the in the uh, the idea of keeping it brief here, uh, I just want to read this one. It's a five-star review from Thwack Shack, who says, uh, absolutely perfect. A professional and thoughtful blend of historical sciences and intelligent open-mindedness. The Seven Ages podcast is exactly what I've been looking for. Most importantly, the content of this podcast is incredible, intriguing, yet always science-based. But additionally, the production quality is fantastic. Finally, the quality of their guests and the interview style provide an insightful completeness to the quality of the podcast. If you're looking for the preeminent podcast, to professionally combine archaeology, anthropology, geology, and modern analysis, the Seven Ages podcast is for you. So we certainly appreciate that. That's an incredible review. And then a shout out to a few other people. There was three other reviews um, written. So again, thank you to all of you who took the few minutes to do that for us. It really does help out in the ratings and the rankings and letting other people find our content. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it- yeah, we appreciate those. And I'll, I'll tell you folks, you know, as these come in and we get these, these really good reviews, Jason text, text those over to us. And, uh, he sent the one that, that he just uh, read a few days ago. He read it, you know, sent it over to me and it was the one he just read is what I was trying to say. Anyway, I was like, man, that sounds like a great show. I, I need to listen to that. I'm like, Oh, he's talking about us. Wow. You know? So yeah, we appreciate it. It's really, that, those are awesome. Yeah. All of those reviews really help. Because, of course, when you guys tell us what you think about the show, that often, with the kind reviews that we receive, encourages other people to want to listen. And again, often what we do here at Seven Ages is a labor of love. We do try to present a scientific perspective and good scientific discussion while remaining open-minded to possibilities and covering all aspects of the historical and archaeological topics that we cover. Occasionally diving deep, deep as in geological deep time. We enjoy all aspects of the process of exploring the history of our planet and what role we as humans play in it. And so if you want to be able to follow along, a few ways you can do that. You can follow us on Twitter, also on Instagram, and of course, we have our YouTube channel. In the days ahead, you'll be able to enjoy some new videos from us. But of course, all the podcast episodes are available there. Our documentary on the Topper site down in South Carolina is also there, and it keeps racking up those views. I mean, it's gotten a lot of views. That is, I mean, head and shoulders above all the others. That's our most popular video. And I'm proud to say one of the more popular videos online about the Topper site, a site we have spent a lot of time there and a lot of time talking with the archaeologists who have worked there and spent field season after field season in the South Carolina heat working that site. We're really proud of the work that's been done down there and what that means for archaeology, not just in the southeast, but really all throughout North America and, in fact, the world. So definitely check out all of the places online where you can find us and the videos, documentaries, and podcasts we produce. And don't forget, of course, we don't charge anything for these podcasts or any of the content that we produce. We don't all draw paychecks, but we do, of course, accept donations. That goes back into the research You know, all of the proceeds that we receive go back toward studying the kinds of topics we discuss on this program. They help to enable us contributing our time in the field and assisting qualified archaeologists on dig sites that are important in our ever-expanding perspective of the history of humankind. So definitely check us out online. And of course, you can make those donations, if you like, at sevenages.org. All right, guys, with that... This conversation has been a long time coming. In our last episode, we talked about Gobekli Tepe. It's an archaeological site that, frankly, everybody is talking about. But this week, we will be talking about it with Martin Sweatman, Ph.D., who has offered some very unique insights about what the art at Gobekli Tepe, this ancient art, which in many ways is anachronistic and has reshaped what we thought we understood about the ancient past, 
Dr. Sweatman will be giving us his perspectives on what that could mean and much more right here when we return on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Quite a conversation lined up today, one that I know that all of us here at Seven Ages have been looking forward to, and it is indeed quite a group, quite a cast that we have joining us today. Now, our guest, Dr. Martin Swetman, holds a PhD in theoretical physics obtained from the University of Bristol in 1995. His research is mainly focused on theoretical aspects of classical statistical mechanics, the physical theory that links the properties of particles like atoms, molecules, colloids, etc., to the properties of matter. However, in recent years, he's also begun to use astronomical calculations and statistical analyses in conjunction with art found at the ancient Turkish site of Gobekli Tepe to work toward understanding what that site's function had been and what it may tell us about the period in history in which it was built. In fact, how that may actually be relevant to us all here on Earth today. So, first and foremost, welcome to the program, Dr. Martin Swetman. Hi, yeah, thank you. Thank you for that introduction. Nice to be here. Indeed, it's wonderful to have you here. We've followed your work for a very long time, uh, much like one of our uh, cohorts and, of course, a past guest on the program but who joins us as a co-host for this special conversation, Dr. Malcolm LeCompte, who's a good friend of mine. And, of course, he has really kept in touch with all of the team in addition to providing scientific information and, and background analysis on a number of projects we've been working with uh, over the years. And again, I think that Malcolm's work is very integral to this area of research. So welcome, Dr. LeCompte. Always good to have you here with us, too. Good to be here. Indeed. Uh, we'll get right into things with you, Dr. Swetman. And of course, you know, you've got a new paper out, which we'll talk with you about as well as, of course, what you've written about in your book and, of course, your paper from a few years ago. But first, I'll turn it over to you, Jason. Well, again, thank you for joining us. Uh, you know, we're very much looking forward to the conversation. Uh, as we begin the second part of our Gobekli Tepe series, uh, we want to begin to look at the potential of the YD impact and how it may play into the symbology of the site. Uh, being that those two things are so uh, tightly integrated through uh, much of the research that's coming to the forefront today, before we get into those details of the symbology and the potential connections, uh, for those listeners who may not be completely uh, up to date on the history, I do want to start with a bit of a review of the origins of the YD impact. So I want to go back to the work of Victor Klub and Bill Napier and the idea of coherent catastrophism. Now, this was championed back in the 1980s and the early 80s, and it sort of set the foundation for much of the research uh, concerning the Younger Dryas today. So, Dr. Sweatman, I'd like to begin there. Uh, could you give us a, a detailed explanation of coherent catastrophism and how it plays into the current research? Sure. Um, so, coherent catastrophism is really um, it, it's suggesting that um, cometary impacts on Earth can happen in bunches, you know, correlated in time. So that's where the coherent part comes from. Uh, and the time scale for those correlated impacts, uh, well, it varies. It depends um, what you're really, what you're talking about. So it could be that there, there's a correlation within a day. So you could have a swarm of cometary fragments impacting Earth on the same day. Uh, and this is what is um, suggested to have happened uh, for the Younger Dryas impact. Uh, it, it could be um, that a much longer time scale. So um, because of the way that meteor streams, um, which is where the comets break up and they form meteor streams, and the way that meteor streams evolve, uh, there is a process known as apsidal precession, uh, and that can produce um, periods of, say, a few hundred years when the risk 
of encountering comet fragments is increased. And it's simply because of when the um, ellipsoidal orbit of a meteor stream, when it cuts Earth's circular, roughly circular orbit, um, that can lead to an enhanced um, risk for a period of a few hundred years. There's a much larger time scale again. So when you have a giant comet orbiting within the inner solar system and it's breaking up, that, that whole breaking up process can take thousands to tens of thousands of years. And so, again, that represents an increased risk. And then there's an even lo- longer time scale, which is suggested, uh, which is perhaps to do with the solar system's movement through the um, orbital plane of the galaxy. And so as, as the solar system sort of goes up and down through the orbital plane, that could potentially lead to um, encounters of other large object stars, for, for instance, that could then um, uh, interact with the, with the Oort cloud, which is where many of these large comets originate from. And so it can knock a bunch of these um, uh, potential comets into the, the solar system. And that happens on a time scale of, well, we don't precisely know uh, exactly, but it might be anywhere from, well, according to the, the data, uh, um, data for things like cratering and um, extinction events and this and this this kind of thing it might be that there is a signal every 15 million years or it's also been suggested that there might be a signal every 25 to 30 million years so something of that order so uh, i guess in relation to younger dryas uh, the the propensity is for people to kind of look for a single impact site or a single crater to kind of explain all of this, but I've kind of in the, have had the same school of thought as as the coherent catastrophism, um, where like it, maybe the torrid meteor shower is an example. You could pass through this high risk area every year uh, for several years, you know, maybe some maybe decades, and every year that you pass through it at this same time period, the Earth would get bombarded by you know by these impacts, and you know maybe air bursts or smaller impacts that would not leave. Uh, long-term traces and you know this could possibly if, if it was recent enough i would say well you know within the last fifteen thousand years or so that that could even get transmitted down through human history and myths and legends um to present day yeah i agree and i, I think that's that's the um that's the argument that's put forward by um Klub and napier and their colleagues is that probably uh, these things have been recorded over time Dr. Swetman, uh, we have a number of science papers that you have authored and co-authored that we'll be discussing with you today. I thought it might be apropos to begin with one of the most recent and then work our way backward in light of the outlined uh, or the outline that you give us of this coherent catastrophism idea, because again, with the with regard to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis, uh, there has been an accumulation of data over the years. It's been something of a slow drip. Many researchers who had been initially resistant to the idea or skeptical for various reasons with the accumulation of additional data from sites, for instance, like Abu Huraira in Syria, and of course, many sites here in America, uh, proxies that include this platinum anomaly virtually found on every continent. Uh, we are now looking at, you know, seriously something significant happening right around 12,700 or so years ago, and this being cataclysmic in proportion. So your recent paper, The Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, Review of the Impact Evidence, looks at this accumulation of data and, and uh, you know, attempts to really kind of pull together the threads and provide a coherent picture. What did your analysis of this data indicate, and what does that mean, mean in the context of coherent catastrophism? Well, so, I mean, the, the, the first paper published by Firestone et al. was 2007. Uh, and since then, there has been this um, scientific debate about whether the impact occurred at all, um, and what effects it may have had, and a very contentious debate. Um, and um, you know, reading reading the, the long list of papers, there are you know, 100 papers or more in this, in this debate, it was really apparent to me that one side really had the upper hand and that the other side, those that are against the theory, were really struggling to, to come up with any any good evidence against it. So, you know, I thought, um, and yet, and yet it seemed to me, this is my perception anyway, I don't know how true it was, it seemed to me that it still wasn't really widely accepted to the impact hypothesis, despite what I could see as being overwhelming evidence. So that's, that's why I decided that um, 
you know, a review paper was needed that at least set the, 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 the stage for, yes, the impact happened. We can still debate about um, what the effects may have been, but I think it, the evidence was so clear that, that you know, something um, dramatic and catastrophic did actually happen 12,800 years ago. Indeed. Uh, in the paper, you note uh, that arguments by a small cohort of researchers against their claims of a major impact are, in general, poorly constructed, and under close scrutiny, most of their evidence, and this is what interests me, you write, can actually be interpreted as supporting the impact hypothesis. Could you give an example of, for instance, a counterclaim or argument against the YDH that might actually appear to support what the current data entails? Um, so one, there was one particular paper by Gil et al. I think it's very highly cited. Um, I can't remember. I think it was perhaps it's in science or nature. And they look at a particular lake somewhere in America. I, I forget the details. And they argue on the basis. Of, so they, they take, um, they were looking at um, um, evidence of flora changes through time from the sediment, they're looking at seeds and, and changes in uh, the types of um, trees and so on that would have been around this lake. And they argue on the basis of their various different um, time series um, data through the, you know, the, the sediments of lake and their um, radiocarbon dating. They argue that um, the evidence is inconsistent with the Younger Dryas uh, impact or hypothesis. Uh, and yet um, that negative outcome depends entirely on their radiocarbon dating of the site. And actually, if you look at their radiocarbon dating, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty in it, which they don't report in their conclusions. Uh, and when you take that uncertainty into account, then it, it, it still the, the evidence is still fully consistent with the impact theory. In fact, when you look at one of their time series, which is the overall change in the flora, um, across time, you know, in other words, with depth in the sediment. When you look at that, the overall change, there is this dramatic change um, and then this dramatic change back to sort of um, sort of Holocene conditions. And you can, you can say, you can suggest that actually that period correlates very well with the Younger Dryas period, which would, be, uh, which would correlate with a very significant change in climate. So if you actually take that as uh, indicating where the, younger, the timing of the Younger Dryas, then actually... It's completely consistent with the, the Younger Dryas theory. Uh, but they discounted that um, simply because they um, preferred a different estimate for um, you know, the sort of age depth model and didn't take, take account of the, uh, the uncertainty in their modeling. So you know, the data is fully consistent with the impact theory. I see. Yeah, as is usually the case, so much can be left open to interpretation, right? And people tend to go looking for things and find what they went looking for. Jason? Yeah, as we begin to kind of suss out some of the details of the impact, I know that traditionally speaking, um, there was a lack of evidence for the tarred meteor stream having an earthly impact, according to a lot of proponents in that camp. So uh, until the evidence for the YD impact began to accumulate, it was it was sort of a fringe theory. But I think the evidence is really beginning to support it now. So when we look back at the history, uh, not only through what Klube and Napier did, but Firestone and, and everyone else involved in the beginnings of the research, uh, for those who may not be as familiar with the proxies and the data, let's just do a quick explanation and review of what is the indicators of earthly impact through the torrid meter, meter stream as far as the proxies that we're looking at. Uh, so there is this um, stratigraphic feature uh, which is found across many continents. And in some places it's found at the bottom of what's known as the Younger Dryas Black Mat. So this is this sort of discolored band of sediment. And, and the geochemical indicators of an impact are found typically at the bottom of this Younger Dryas Black Mat, but not exclusively. There may be some places where the Black Mat isn't apparent, but the geochemical indicators are still there. Uh, and when we measure the, the timing of this, this, this layer, it appears to be consistent with um, a single event, a single time. And, and the, the indicators that are, that are at the base of this, or at this boundary layer, which is often at the base of the black mat, um, as you've mentioned, they are platinum. Um, there are also impact microspherals, which are 
which are which are um, generated by essentially the heat of, of an impact uh, doesn't necessarily need to be a crater forming impact so it could be like an air burst which still generates a lot of heat and melts surface material on the ground uh, so all that molten material is dispersed as like a fine mist and it can then uh, solidify into tiny little microscopic particles which have uh, telltale signs of rapid cooling. This is the sort of surface features that we can see under a microscope. So you've got the impact microspherals. Uh, there are also um, abundant nano diamonds. Uh, so again, these are nanoscopic carbon structures with a, with a structure similar to or the same as diamond, typically embedded within larger carbon particles. Uh, and that's another indication for an impact because it's typically thought that you need extreme pressures and temperatures to to create these sort of little diamond inclusions. And um, I think, have I covered everything? Is there one more? I think there's one more. There are, there are also melt products. So there are certain regions of the ground which uh, appear to have been melted. So quite large particles now. It basically looks like molten glass. And, um, yeah, I think I've covered everything yeah. there. Yeah, those are, those are all very good indicators, and it's been a driving force behind some of the science that's been going on. And I do want to take this opportunity uh, that we do have Malcolm here with us uh, because he's directly involved with uh, finding these proxies. Uh, Malcolm, could you build for just a moment on some of the research as far as um, finding and discovering those proxies and a little bit of the process uh, as far as that's concerned? I was going to add to it that one of the things – that's just a very recent uh, discovery in these these this strata is uh, shock quartz. We're starting to find more sites producing shock quartz than we had. We'd only had one or two instances before. Now we're seeing a lot more uh, of uh, the planar deformations that are called PDFs or or the partial planar deformations, which is a, a more uh, say a lower level of, of shocking of, of quartz quartz grains as we examine more and more sites so that's that's pretty much a, a gold standard I, I believe for uh, that and the PGEs we're starting to see PGEs including uh, more diversity in the PGE and uh, and we think we're starting to see evidence of the impactor itself which is very exciting uh, so it's it's uh, it's been a long process of really evolving techniques because the uh, investigation of errors is sort of an infant science in many respects. So the, the methodologies and all are, are rapidly evolving uh, as we have an opportunity to do more and more sites and see kind of different expressions of, of this event uh, and how it's, how it's uh, laid out in, in these sites. Uh, possibly even some craters, uh, small you know, airburst type of craters uh, are coming up on our horizon here. Nothing proven yet. Uh, it's still in the process of, of uh, what would you call it, validation. But, uh, but these are the sort of, sorts of things we're pursuing at the moment. I think some important distinctions have been made here because, well, Dr. Sweatman's point that uh, some of these uh, um, proxies for impacts can be produced with, through the process of air bursting and not actual impact into the, you know, the, the planet itself. Uh, but my question is, what was about shock quartz? Can shock quartz be produced from an air burst, or is that, or is that only produced through impact into uh, um, continental rock? It's debated. There have been uh, claims that it could not be produced in an air burst, and and but we're seeing it. And the question is, is there a crater we just missed? So at this point, it's that's a question that's outstanding. I believe that there have been examples of shock quartz identified at, at Tunguska, which is. Uh, nominally an airburst. I think uh, the Lake Checo is still debated, but uh, like I say, there's a lot of a lot of activity in terms of debating these these various proxies, and, and the jury's out. <laughs> Indeed, but that's what makes this fun, in my opinion. You know, the accumulation of the new data that helps us build the most. Uh, efficient model for explaining all the phenomena observed. I think we've established the case of, of you know, the YD impact. And, and of course, if anybody wants to go back and look at our coverage, we have uh, three previous episodes covering all the fine details of it. Uh, but as we begin to push forward into the, the prime primary portion of the conversation today, which is Gobekli Tepe, um, we've established again the YD impact and the importance of it uh, as we are still sussing out the details of it. Um, 
shining amongst that is this totally enigmatic, incredible site of Gobekli Tepe. And so as we discussed in our first uh, conversation with, uh, about Gobekli Tepe, we've established where it's at, where it's located, and the basic layout of it. But it's the details of the site, the art, the symbology, and what that art and symbology may be reflecting that we want to look at in depth today with Dr. Sweatman. So as we begin to get into the conversation of Gobekli Tepe, um, first of all, how did you become involved with it, and what is it about the site that first drew your attention? Well, I became aware of it, I think, probably around mm, 2008. Uh, um, I don't know. I just saw a, a video online, and um, you know, I had a general interest in ancient civilizations and uh, our ancient history. And, um, yeah, so it was at that time it was proclaimed as being a very anomalous and uh, incredible site, so I took an interest. and I had no idea at that time what the, um, the symbols meant. I, I couldn't figure it out either. Um, um, but then, you know, I, I took an interest. I read papers, um, archaeological papers, anything really of in, of, that was related to uh, Gebet Gutepe. And, and, and uh, along that journey, I read Graham Hancock's book, Magicians of the Gods, and within a, a section of that book, there was what seemed to me to be the key to actually decoding um, a lot of the symbols at Gebekli Tepe. Uh, and so I, it sort of struck me that you know, there's, there may be something in this, and that's this astronomical interpretation. Uh, and so I, I pursued it, and very quickly, it all, um, you know, within a matter of days, um, um, a lot of the, um, the symbols, their meaning, um, became apparent to me, uh, and so you know I kept I kept plugging away at it, and eventually managed to um, publish a paper. Indeed, that paper is indeed one of the most interesting articles I think that I've read in recent years, having to do with Gobekli Tepe, because of course there's the archaeological side of it, what we can excavate, what is radiocarbon datable, you know, material remains that are left behind. But always, of course, the question remains, especially with archaeology, and the further we, you know, we, the further we go back, sometimes the more difficult it is to assess what was the meaning, you know, what was going through the minds of the people who lived here. What I think makes Gobekli Tepe unique, Doctor Sweatman, is the fact that there is so much art, and for a site so old, again, this was viewed by many as being anachronistic. But what is it that the art at Gobekli Tepe conveys. We see both animals and what are clearly identifiable features that you know are recognized to us today. Then there are also some symbolic elements which, again, are left somewhat open to uh, interpretation. Can we discuss the symbols and the animal representations that we find at Gobekli Tepe? Yeah. Um, so, what exactly would you like to discuss? There's a, lot, a lot of, there's a lot of symbols to go through. Let's let's start with the animals. Uh, of course, we have, for instance, Pillar Forty Three, the so-called Vulture Stone. Uh, let's let's work through some of the actual representations of animals that are represented at the site. Uh, how that correlates, for instance, with remains that have been also found at the site, and and what these animals may represent. Then we'll move on to symbols. Yeah, so I mean, Pillar Forty Three is you know it's probably the the main um, well it's the most artistically decorated pillar I think there yeah, that's fair to say uh, it's the one with most information you could say on it um, and um, at the centre of that pillar is is a little circle and um, the site's archaeologist interpret that as perhaps being a head perhaps a skull or something like this but I mean if you look at the circle it's just a plain circle um, you know, there's no there's no obvious sort of head-like features. However, there is another pillar, Pillar 18, which is one of the very tall pillars at the centre of Enclosure D. And um, just beneath what you might say is the head of that pillar, sort of like a brooch, um, is another circle and what appears to be a moon symbol. And so you could take that to perhaps indicate a moon and the sun together. And, and that wouldn't be a surprise in you know, many cultures um, worshipped as deities, essentially, the moon and the sun. So to have a moon and a sun symbol together would make a lot of sense. So the circle perhaps represents the sun, and it, it kind of indicates that maybe a lot of the symbols at the site are astronomical. So taking that idea, um, and then you know, going back to Pillar 43, what if that circle at the, at, on this main part of Pillar 43, what if that circle is also the sun? 
Um, well, in that case, what would the animals represent? Logically, they might represent constellations. That would be a very natural um, idea to propose. Um, doesn't mean they have to be, but you know, let, let's explore that idea. You also see on that panel of the pillar, you see a scorpion. Now, we're very familiar with um, Scorpius as a, a constellation. We, again, we see the scorpion symbol in many later um, civilizations. We see it in ancient Egypt. We see it in Mesopotamia. So, again, seeing the scorpion and interpreting that as a constellation uh, makes a lot of sense. Well, if this, is, if this really is the scorpion, the Scorpius constellation that we know, then maybe they're using the same constellation set that we currently use, or at least something very similar to it, but just using, in many cases, different symbols, different animals uh, than we currently use. And so, you know, if you look at that main pillar, if, if you've got um, Scorpius here, then above that, if, if you take the scene as being at sunset, then above the Scorpion, you'd expect to see Sagittarius, which we know as the archer, um, um, but we don't see um, a centaur as, as an archer instead what we see on the pillar is a vulture but its wings are spread in a very uncannily um, sort of similar way to the bow of the archer so you might say okay then maybe that represents Sagittarius and below um, the scorpion we have this duck which might be an indication of, of Libra below left of the scorpion you have you expect to see you know if they're using the same constellations you'd expect to see lupus and in fact in exactly that position there is a dog in exactly the pose that you would expect and that's a really strong indication that this might be onto something and to the right of the eagle uh, sorry the, the vulture eagle thing there is um another bending bird with a snake sort of coming down from its beak and that kind of resembles somewhat the constellation Ophiuchus. so you could make a good case, but it's not um, not watertight by any means. You can make a good case that that might be representing a patch of the sky. Uh, and, you know, why would you then have the sun in a particular position relative to the constellations? Well, one reason might be to indicate a date using precession of the equinoxes. Now, obviously, that would be a controversial. Apart from the very existence of our constellations at such an early time, the possibility that these people would have known about procession of the equinoxes, well, that's controversial too, but I don't see any real problem with it. So perhaps they were giving a date using procession of the equinoxes where the sun is positioned relative to what we know as constellation Sagittarius. And if you, if you ask, well, what date is that? Then it corresponds pretty closely to the date of the Younger Dryas impact. Now that's fairly good evidence but it's not very strong evidence because we've got a limited amount of information there are a limited number of symbols and correlations with um, um what we see uh, in the sky but then at the top of there's another panel um, another section of the pillar at the top of pillar 43 with the sort of three handbag symbols but i interpret them as sunsets and you could argue that well perhaps these are if if the sun relative to Sagittarius or this eagle vulture is representing the summer solstice, then maybe these three other animal symbols are representing the other solstice and equinoctial, um, equinox constellations, uh, which would make sense. If you're trying to write a date, you, you, can, you can specify that date more accurately if you use all four of these special um, times of the year, these, these equinoxes and, and solstices. And again, if you go through those animal symbols at the top left, you've got um, the bending bird, and we expect that to be Pisces, if, if this um, date is correct, and it matches very well with Pisces. On the right hand of the pillar at the top, you've got this sort of down-crawling quadruped, which looks a bit like perhaps a frog or a, perhaps a bear, sort of moving downward. And again, that fits reasonably well with this idea of the Virgo constellation. And so it all tends to um, sort of correlate um, really well. Uh, and so that's essentially what I wrote in this uh, 2017 paper. That is a fantastic breakdown. Thank you, by the way. Uh, I, I couldn't have asked for a better uh, summary of everything right there. Uh, a few points that are worthy of touching on. Uh, and I think first we'll touch on procession of the equinoxes. Again, you mentioned that that would be a controversial idea because we recognize this as, you know, probably having first been recognized by astronomers in ancient Greece. Uh, certainly we wouldn't go all the way back to 12 or 13,000 BC and find evidence of that. Or would we? Again, the, the fantastic uh, voluminous work by uh, Giorgio de Santiana and Ertha von Dechend, Hamlet's Mill, which I'm sure you're familiar with. 
I mean, that certainly comes to mind, and there does seem to be a rather compelling case that world traditions, which probably go well back into prehistory, well before written language, they do seem to convey knowledge of the processional cycles. Would you want to comment on that? Well, specifically that book, I mean, it's quite a difficult read. Um, yes. And, you know, it, it, interpreting myth is always tricky. Um, you often bring to it your own biases of, of what you want to interpret within that myth. But, you know, they make a good case and, you know, uh, you know it's certainly a reasonable case. So um, I think there are, there's other evidence which is probably um, even stronger than, than, than what is written in that book. I mean, having now decoded, essentially, I think, um, the, the symbols at Quebec Tepe, you, you can now find, if you look for it, you can find lots of other evidence throughout the ages for when this system of constellations and procession of the equinoxes was used to write dates. In fact, in my view, it even goes back before um, the Younger Dryas impact, and we're talking about Paleolithic cave art here. So I suggest the same kind of system was in use way, way back in history. Yes, in your paper, you give examples, for instance, of what appear to be archaeoastronomical knowledge that's even conveyed at sites like Lascaux. Uh, so, again, if we're looking at the Magdalenian period, and we can consider maybe 12,000 to as far back as 17,000 years ago, I mean, that's well in advance of Gobekli Tepe. Uh, another point that we should raise also, um, having to do with the the animalistic interpretations, and this is primarily why I ask you about that. You know, critics would say, Dr. Sweatman, as I'm certain that you've heard plenty of them, um, they would say, well, how do we know that they would have used the same animals that we would recognize in our Zodiac today? Now, of course, as a good interviewer, I can't just ask you easy questions and agree with you all day. But I will point out that some of the earliest knowledge, I believe, on record of modern zodiacal symbols go back. I think this discovered in Malta going back at least 5000 years. So there is some that is, you know, some archaeological evidence that supports a much earlier usage of some of these zodiacal symbols. But I think significantly, as you point out, not all of the animals at Gobekli Tepe are perfect corollaries for our modern zodiac. Some of them appear to be close approximations. The example that you give, of course, the vulture with its arms outspread, you know, resembling the archer. Is it possible that we aren't actually seeing a direct corollary, but we're seeing people doing what people do? I know when you or I go and we look at the sky at night, if we are observing asterisms, we will see patterns. We will see shapes. That's what humans do. Paradilia, you know, certainly takes shape when humans are looking at clouds, leaves, any number of things. So is it possible that we actually don't see a direct corollary, but we see a close approximation for what we recognize as constellation uh, bodies today, represented at Gobekli Tepe, maybe in an earlier form? Yeah, so I mean, in, my argument is that um, that they weren't using um, the same symbols, or very few of them. Uh, and in fact, maybe they were using some of the same symbols, but to represent different constellations. Um, so you know, I, I'm not saying that their zodiacal symbols are the same as ours, but their constellations um, appear to fit very well with the constellations uh, that we are using. If 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 this if this interpretation is correct, now. In the paper that I published, um, I tried to provide a statistical argument which supported the interpretation. And um, so when you say, is, is it possible there's, there's been a mistake? Yeah, it, it's possible that this is wrong. Um, but the statistical argument that I, I used in the paper, I think, um, provides good evidence that it, it is indeed correct. However, there's a perhaps an even stronger argument is that when you go back to the Paleolithic times and look at the cave art, um, we can now do a properly scientific test, statistical test, that compares the expected sort of zodiacal date based on the animal symbols of these different animal paintings. So we can compare the zodiacal date with the radiocarbon date of these um, specific paintings, all the paintings that have been radiocarbon dated. And when we do that proper statistical test, again, we find an incredible level of agreement. So, you know, th that is now a proper scientific study, which says that the system almost certainly existed in Paleolithic cave art. And therefore, it's no surprise to me to see the same system um, appearing at Gebekli Tepe. Again, it really seems to become more difficult with time to argue that, you know, ancient observers were not very well aware of astronomical occurrences and that they accurately recorded those again there is too much consistency in my opinion 
uh, in what is, you know, forming the body of the archaeoastronomical record. Jason. Yeah, well, as, as we're listening to the discussion here and we're talking about things, uh, you know, a lot of speculation, um, what did they know, what did they not know, um, you know, their interpretations of the Zodiac, uh, things of this this manner. But, you know, uh, the site itself, Gobekli Tepe, was not necessarily supposed to exist. Um, finding it at such an early date, um, enigmatic in itself, it is itself an anomaly. It's not supposed to be there according to what we knew up until this point. As we say, there was no Gobekli Tepe until there was a Gobekli Tepe. And so as we begin to try to look at the connection, if there is one, to the Younger Dryas impact, uh, in our first part of uh, this series, we discussed, you know, why is it there? What is it representing? And so my question to you, Dr. Sweatman, is being that the time period seem to match so closely to um, the establishment of the site versus the Younger Dryas impact. Um, you know, we were discussing what would drive hunter-gatherers to a centralized location? What would cause them to build something of such reverence uh, in a location high on a hill overlooking a vast area? It seemed to be a meeting place for a very specific reason. So when we're interpreting that data, um, is there anything specific about the site that seems to drive it to the Younger Dryas impact, basically something so catastrophic that it caused them to change the hunter-gatherer lifestyle in order to focus on a centralized place. Does that make sense? Uh, well, that's one thing we can point to is that one of the um, locations where this boundary layer, this Younger Dryas boundary layer has been found is at Abu Huraira. Um, I think you mentioned it before. So that's about 100 miles south, roughly, of Quebec Tepe. Um, and so the, you know, the, the, presumably the people of that region at that time that the impact happened would have been um, scattered, perhaps. And, you know, many of their um, settlements um, would have been ruined. And according to you know, some of the evidence that's been produced, some of the papers, they're suggesting that there was a, a period of darkness created by all the ash and soot that was thrown up. So you have to try and imagine the situation um, during the event and, and shortly after the event when perhaps the world was, in at least this part of the world, was in complete darkness for a, for a long time, maybe a matter of weeks. Uh, and how would people cope with that? And many of the animals might also have been uh, killed. Also, animals would have been struggling in the darkness to find their own food. It would have, become, would have um, presumably been uh, you know, gone through starvation and, and so on. So what, how would the people react to that? I mean. I'm, I'm speculating as, as much as anyone is, but perhaps one of the first things you'd need to do is to, to struggle through the darkness. You'd need to find each other. So perhaps you could set up some kind of beacon on a hilltop to try and attract people to say, yes, you know, we're still alive, we're still here, perhaps. Um, so maybe that's, that's how um, a hilltop site might have initially um, started. Perhaps also being on top of a hill, it could provide safety. Um, you've also got being on top of a hill um, you can see the sky very well, so you can you can monitor the sky in case there are only going, going to be any um, further impending impacts in the near future. So you know, there are some reasons we can suggest as to why Bepi Tepe was chosen, that site. Yeah, and I think that's really one of the fascinating portions of the discussion is, you know, we discussed in the, in the first part of, you know, what would cause a hunter-gatherer society to stop doing that and going to a centralized location because it's, it's really not beneficial. Uh, to leave that lifestyle of hunter gathering where you have that encompassing freedom to do what you will, um, to leave a situation if you're, you're not getting along with others, that sort of thing. So coming to a central area um, is often detrimental as we see with you know, modern urban society. But I can't help but think that there must have been something to drive that sort of gathering. Um, and it would make sense. Again, we're speculating here because Gobekli, there's a lot of speculating today because Gobekli, Tepe is um, absent in a lot of ways of hard evidence. We only have what is there to discover. So we do have to think about these things abstractly. But, you know, I keep thinking, was there some driving event, i.e. the YD impact, that pushed them there? And as we discussed in part one, it seems to be at least 1,500 years that they were on the site. So it seems like there may have been something to establish it and then something to continue the tradition um, of looking to the sky, and maybe we see that reflected in Pillar 43 and Enclosure D uh, on the vulture stone that you discussed earlier. 
Yeah. So, I mean, in my book, I, I make a lot of the possibility that the impact um, sort of sparked, generated, catalyzed uh, a new religion, essentially um, a, a comet cult, let's call it. Uh, and so once you have um, perhaps a new religion that draws people together, they, they want to um, behave in a more communal manner because of this, uh, this, this, this new religion. Perhaps that's something that would um, um, keep people together, draw them into um, creating larger and larger settlements. So essentially religion, perhaps generated by the impact, is, is the key factor here. And also, I mean, we, if you think about how old really is Gebekli Tepe, we, the, the oldest radiocarbon date we have so far is for um, the, the wall of Enclosure D, which is about 9,500 BC, plus or minus a few hundred years. Um, but that surely isn't the, the oldest, uh, that's not the earliest time of Gebekli Tepe. Um, the archaeologists haven't really gone down into the centre of Gebekli Tepe so I suspect, you know, when at, the, at the end of the day, this is like a prediction, essentially, that probably you'll find that Gebekli Tepe, its roots began, I suspect, not long after the Younger Dryas impact. So that's a prediction. Yeah, fascinating stuff. Again, our guest is Dr. Martin Sweatman, and his book, Prehistory Decoded, of course, we'll have that linked in the show notes, along with where you can read his papers online, which will give a wonderful overview of everything that we're discussing here. So much to discuss, so little time. James, take it away. You know, I've spent some amount of time thinking about this subject and about hunter-gatherers, you know, coming together to um, construct this site. But uh, alternative hypothesis I just want to float out there is, is it possible that Gobekli Tepe was actually not constructed by uh, these hunter-gatherers that, you know, coalesced or came together on the site and actually was constructed by another group of individuals that were, you know, more sophisticated and more advanced, but, you know, because of the younger drives or some other uh, some other uh, um, uh, driver, they abandoned the site, and the and the hunter gatherers groups that actually occupied the site, um, you know, later on or you know in, even you know close to the same time frame, uh, were not the you know not the builders. It was just uh, it, it to me it sort of seems like it makes more sense for for that type of thing to happen, and not the hunter gatherers just kind of spontaneously you know get together and create all of this, 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 uh, these sites that had not been imagined by them before. Yeah. I mean, it's entirely possible. Um, that essentially a level of civilization that's currently unrecognized could have existed before the impact. I and mean, if that is the case, then I, it couldn't have been a very advanced civilization as, as has been suggested by some people. I think, you know, it would still potentially have been a stone age civilization, but it's entirely feasible that, this a sort of fledgling civilization um, maybe was um, decimated, wiped out by by the impact, and so they relocated and, and started again at Quebec Tepe. That's entirely possible. We just don't have any evidence for that yet. Yes, that's a very important point too, Dr. Sweatman. Again, that it very well may have been that it wasn't a highly advanced, but that there may have been a level of advancement. I mean, that much already seems evident. At Gobekli Tepe, I think it would be hard to argue that whoever the builders were, that they didn't have a degree of advancement that exceeded what we would have expected of Neolithic pre-pottery hunter-gatherers in Anatolia, Turkey. Now, one point that should also be made is that, as we know from the archaeology, that there were the successive burials and then reconstructions of similar, you know, T-shaped pillars, which became increasingly smaller and smaller with time, and then the successive burial of those and rebuilding burial which formed the so-called Potbelly Hill we know today as Gobekli Tepe. Um, and that shows, of course, that there was some use over time. Uh, but again, that doesn't preclude the idea that people who had built those you know, successive sites and that the excavations reveal in layers now um, hadn't maintained a knowledge and an awareness and had had some sort of a you know, idea, some sort of a cultural meaning, some sort of a belief system that they obviously seem to incorporate there. Uh, you know, coming back to belief systems and symbology, Dr. Sweatman, you know, you mentioned these uh, so-called handbags. I noticed that you use that terminology and you interpret these as being, again, sunrise or sunset. Um, but you use that terminology, which I guess is probably most prevalently featured in works by the aforementioned Graham Hancock, Fingerprints of the Gods, I think, going all the way back to the early 1990s. <laughs> I am interested in that, uh, the fact that, as Hancock had pointed out, 
you know, and I know he catches a lot of heat from the mainstream archaeological community. I try to look at everybody fairly. And he does correctly point out that there is a certain consistency in that particular motif uh, in various different cultures throughout time. And it's fascinating that we see that as well as the so-called H shape. Uh, also, the U shape, I think, that features into the belts on the two primary T-shaped pillars, which are very anthropomorphic uh, in their characteristics, having arms, apparently wearing belts, having little you know, loincloths or girdles. Uh, so, you know, considering the fact that there is such consistency between these appearances of these symbols that we find at Gobekli Tepe, but that they appear in other places with other cultures much later. Do you ascribe any significance to that? Could we say that that's entirely just coincidence, or does that seem to establish a direct link in terms of continuity and the meaning of certain symbols that do appear throughout time? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. Um, obviously, we can't say anything definite. Um, to my mind, I suspect there probably is a link, um, at least between some of the this sort of stone handbags that are found in uh, ancient Mesopotamia. Um, again, we, we see these nice um, sort of handbag shapes with animal symbols, just as we see at the top of Pillar 43. And although there's a time gap of, say, 6,000 years, um, that doesn't trouble me too much, although I'd like to see intermediate stages, obviously. But still, I think we have to be open to the possibility. I don't think we can just uh, rule it out. I think it's also worth noting that um, the, the, the first lead archaeologist of the site, Klaus Schmidt, um, who, who unfortunately passed away. Um, you know, he he was quite open to the idea of making links between the symbolism at Quebec and Tepe and later civilizations such as Egypt and Mesopotamia. Um, so, you know, if if he can do it, then um, I don't see why someone else can't too. Certainly. Again, I guess it gets more controversial when we talk about the appearance of similar shapes, for instance, in Mesoamerica, uh, you know, many, many thousands of years later. It very well could be that these are some kind of almost like an archetypal image that for some reason humans tend to gravitate toward and they can be independently discovered or created and maybe have completely different meanings in different parts of the world. So I don't think that we necessarily have to advocate hyperdiffusionism in order to account for the similarity that appear in various parts of the world. But what somewhat troubles me is the notion that even where we have continents that are, I mean, accessible to one another, you know, North and South America, uh, there is a, a general aversion, I, I find, uh, to making associations between or the, you know, presumption that cultures might have been in contact. You know, we've spoken in the past with Dr. Robert Carballo of Boston University. I mean, and he lays it out there. You find, you know, Mesoamerican obsidian at much more northern climes, you know, North American, uh, uh, indigenous American sites. Uh, and that's just one example, the transfer of cocoa and other kinds of things. I mean, obviously, people were trading over great distances. There's archaeological evidence in support of that. Why it seems to be so controversial, I'll never understand. But if we think about, again, in the Middle East, if we're talking about Turkey and, you know, the ancient Mesopotamians and what they were doing many thousands of years later, I mean, th that's not a great distance to have to travel. And so that there would be continuity and that some of these ideas would be carried over uh, throughout time doesn't seem very controversial to me, at least. Now, I want to talk also about the snake. The snake, although, of course, the, the paper, the subtitle is What Does the Fox Say? But the snake is a somewhat peculiar outlier in terms of the animals represented at Gobekli Tepe. Can you talk about why that is, what makes it distinct, and what it could possibly represent in light of that? Yeah, so I mean, the, the serpent is a really common symbol in mythology, uh, religious symbolism um, across the world, especially in that part of the world. Uh, so at Gobekli Tepe, um, it's interesting that you know, within the fill that the archaeologists have very carefully gone through and they identified uh, all sorts of different um, remains within that fill, animal remains, uh, the one thing they haven't found, they found just about everything in there uh, apart from any um, serpent or snake remains. Uh, and yet we see the serpent symbolism on the pillars is probably the most prevalent uh, animal symbol at Quebec Tepe. So it's, it's curious as to why the serpent, or sorry, rather, but, right, why snake remains aren't found uh, in the fill at Quebec Tepe. It suggests it has some kind of special meaning, something slightly different to the other animals. Um, now, I think a, a really good indication of what the, the snake indicates at Quebec Tepe is, I think it's pillar 33. Uh, so pillar 33 um, is another very ornate pillar. It has on one side 
um, a fox, and on the other face it has um, a pair of bending birds, or let's say tall bending birds. And out of these animals are emanating snakes, and they are emanating in sort of bunches from the legs and the torsos of these animals. And the snake heads converge on the inner face of the pillar. Now, that is really peculiar. You know, if, if you're going to interpret these animals as essentially animals, then it's, you know, it doesn't make much sense to have snakes, actual snakes, coming out of their torsos and out of their legs. Um, but if you interpret the animal symbols as constellations, then it makes perfect sense to interpret the snakes as meteor streams. Um, you know, that's a very good visual um, symbol for uh, a meteor streaking through the sky. Um, and of course, that fits with the whole idea of um, Kabaki Tepe being related to the younger Dras impact. So to my mind, I think we have you know, reasonably good evidence that, that the snake indicates um, a meteor. And of the fox, of course, there's been a lot of emphasis laid on the, you know, apparent relationship between the fox and how that might actually also convey a comet or some other kind of space object colliding. You know, you, I think, balance it very well in your paper uh, when you address that. But could we talk a little about what the fox may or may not represent as well? So, yeah, so the, the fox is, is another animal symbol. So therefore, probably, um, according to, the, according to the, 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 the interpretation and the statistical argument that I present, Probably it's a um, another constellation. Uh, so which constellation is it? Well, if you look at um, several of the pillars, it, it fits very well, and the shape of the fox fits very well with the upper part of Aquarius. Uh, and it just turns out that um, Aquarius would have been the position in the sky where the torrid meteor stream would have been at maximum intensity. So to my mind, you know, again, it all fits with this idea that Kibaki Tepe is associated with the younger Dryas impact. And uh, yeah, the fox essentially represents something like our modern constellation of Aquarius. Yeah, and so often in these ancient cultures, uh, you know, the interpretation of the meaning and the symbology is, you know, is always something that's at the forefront of research. But so often they simply painted what they saw, as we see in cave art. Um, they painted animals and things that they were familiar with, things that made up their world. So your interpretation of the snakes and the way that they're related to the artwork, um, it really does uh, resonate with me. It makes sense because, again, they're painting, they're carving what they see, what's familiar to them. Um, there's not always a lot of abstract thought into it. They're basically just laying down their world and what they're familiar with. And so, as we know, Gobekli Tepe has given us a lot of really tantalizing clues, but much of it's still unexcavated. So there's still a lot there to learn. So as we uh, hope over the coming decades that the excavations continue and we're able to see more and more of the site or other sites in the region or area that are similar to it, if there was one particular type of evidence that you're looking for to connect it truly to the YD impact as the excavations continue over the years, for you, what would be the smoking gun of evidence to connect the two together? Oh, I, I don't have any uh, smoking gun like that. I haven't um, really thought of that question. I mean, presumably, what I'd like to see is that as, as the archaeologists excavate more and more, and we, we find more and more symbols like this, that um, they remain consistent with this original idea. If we start finding that um, suddenly it doesn't, you know, the animal symbols, the snakes and so on, are sort of in random positions and it doesn't make much sense, um, then that would be a problem. But so long as it remains consistent, with this, uh, with what we already find, um, then I think you know, as time goes by, as more and more of the evidence comes in and it's consistent, then then I think it make, makes the argument even stronger. Certainly, Malcolm, would you like to jump in with any questions or anything? Uh, no, I've just been enjoying the the, uh, the dialogue. It's it's uh, you know, I I watched your videos, Martin, and uh, got a sense of of the argument from those and uh, on the YouTube. YouTube channel, uh, and uh, so I've, I've been able to follow because of that. And uh, just wondering, are, are you? It almost seems like you're developing a new type of archaeology. I don't know enough about archaeology, unfortunately, to to know for sure whether or not statistical archaeology is a real thing. But it sounds like you, you're you, if you haven't already invented it, <laughs> then it ought to be. Well, I think there's this. this 
view, um, maybe quite a popular view in archaeology, that it's impossible to interpret uh, ancient symbols it, with any kind of confidence, and that uh, any interpretation is as good as any other. And so, yeah, I agree. I, I guess what I'm doing is trying to put a, a scientific angle on that and say, well, maybe we can actually distinguish between um, different interpretations and, and give um, some uh, estimate of confidence, just as you would in any, any other scientific discipline, as to which is the correct or more likely to be the correct interpretation. So I'm trying to make it more scientific. And, and the work of Gebekli Tepe is not quite scientific because there is still this subjectivity in, um, I mean, I didn't go into the details here, but there's still some degree of subjectivity in the ranking of how you assess which constellation and which animal symbols uh, fit very well. That is something that I'm currently working on right now to make it less subjective. Hopefully there'll be a paper forthcoming next year about that. Um, but then when you go back to the Paleolithic cave art, we, we do genuinely have a properly scientific test uh, for this, the zodiacal hypothesis. So, yeah, um, in, in some ways I'm, I'm kind of surprised that um, archaeology or whatever discipline it is that studies these symbols hasn't adopted a more, let's say, um, scientific hypothesis testing route already. Um, maybe, maybe it has, um, but at least that's what I'm trying to do. It's intriguing, because I, I, in our lifetime, we've had the emergence of astroarchaeology, which was prior to that, something that was unknown, and or at least uh, maybe suspected, but that was about it. And just in, as I say, in our lifetimes, that's emerged as a, as a major branch of, of archaeology. But the other thing, the other comment I have in my experience with archaeologists is that subjectivity shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> that's kind of their, their, their stock and trade. <laughs> Oh, I agree about that. So, you know, many of the um, many archaeological papers will be comparing different types of stone tool amongst different sites and different um, cultures. And, you know, at the moment, much of that is simply done by eyeballing, just simply by looking at the stone tool and saying, yeah, I think that fits with that that group. Again, you could you could use a more um, quantitative approach using some kind of digital image analysis to rigorously classify. And maybe this is already done. It may, it may well be. Or is ongoing. Um, so you know, I, I agree. We perhaps we can start out with some kind of hunch or, or um, subjective opinion, and then you know, over time, we can bring in um, better scientific tools um, to, to establish that. One other thing that that uh, occurs to me is that it's something that uh, has appeared in North North American archaeology that I'm aware of, and apparently is a is a feature of European archaeology is something called the Y-stick symbology, which apparently is is some sort of a shaman-based uh, symbology of, of uh, a number of things that uh, I, I can pass on some papers to you about uh, the importance of that. I'm just wondering if there's anything like that, that uh, if you're familiar with it, that, that might have been found at, at, uh, at Quebec with Epi. Um, I'd be interested to, to see that. I haven't, I haven't um, heard anything about that so far. An, an interesting, an interesting um, sort of corollary to this is that commonly it's assumed that constellations were invented, or at least the zodiacal constellations were invented in sort of the, the second millennium BC in Mesopotamia, and that precession of the equinoxes was discovered by Hipparchus in. Um, it was the, the second century BC, I think, in Greece. You know, th these these are just um, assumptions. There's actually uh, no really strong argument to support either of those statements. There's no reason why our constellation set couldn't be much older. If you actually go and if you read the papers and look at the details of how um, scholars have arrived at those conclusions, they are very weak. So there's no real there's no really strong reason to believe that our zodiacal constellations were invented first or written down first, uh, well, invented first um, in second millennium BC. That is, it's really not a strong um, point of view. Well, Martin, you know, on that point, again, I think that a lot of that presumption is based on existing archaeological discoveries. And as new ones come forth over time, there seems to be a much widening uh, you know, kind of perspective that we're beginning to see in terms of how far some of these concepts go back. I mean, that's certainly the case. Again, I mentioned a a sort of a star chart, I believe, that was discovered at Malta. I'll have to actually get the information. I believe we've reported on that in the past on the podcast. But, I mean, this dating back about 5,000 years, 
and would strongly seem to suggest that uh, some of those motifs were in use prior to, you know, the consensus opinion on their, you know, origins in, you know, ancient Babylonia or what have you. And then when we look at something along the lines of, uh, as you speak about uh, the procession of the equinoxes, again, that really fascinates me because, yes, Hipparchus, of course, is recognized historically as being the first to, to notice this. But there are many instances, and you actually mentioned that uh, you felt that there may be some uh, which better represent the idea of an earlier discovery or knowledge of that phenomena than those outlined, for instance, by De Santiana and Deccan. Would you talk briefly at all, if you'd like to, about what some of those evidences might be? Do you have uh, specific examples that you think strongly suggests that precession of the equinoxes and similar celestial phenomena might have been known to ancient observers? Well, I mean, I've actually written another paper, um, it's probably not uh, very well known, which um, describes several ancient artworks where we have animal symbols, or especially four animals um, together in the the same uh, picture. And so one of those cases is the Lascaux Cave. Another one of those cases is known as the Pashputi Seal, which was found um, in India, roughly 2000, dates to roughly 2000 BC. And these are actually really, really similar scenes, the Lascaux Cave and the Pashputi Seal. Uh, and in my view, that's pretty good evidence that this uh, they're actually giving a date which is separated by um, one half of a great year, so in other words, thirteen thousand years, and that and that seems to work out pretty well. So there are, again, it's in my paper, but there are several artworks from different cultures around the world, um, which give you this indication. There are, um, there's a very nice um, scene, a rock art scene from um, pre-dynastic Egypt. Um, it's in the Egyptian, I forget the name of the Egyptian desert. And again, the, this rock art scene so far is interpreted as being evidence for the existence of this hypothetical uh, scorpion king. But in fact, um, it, it can be entirely interpreted in terms of the um, this zodiacal theory. And in fact, I would say it's an, a more convincing interpretation using this zodiacal theory. So actually, this scene is giving us a date, probably about 3500 BC. Um, you've even got snakes emanating from a tall bird as well, just as we have at Gebepi Tepe. So um, you know, there is so much correspondence, so much similarity there that I think there's a reasonably good case. That is an example. Indeed. Uh, in fact, for, for my next book, I'll be I'll be trying. I mean, this this is years in planning, years ahead. I will be trying to document all these different cases that I've come across that, that provide evidence for the existence of this widespread use of a zodiacal dating system. That's fascinating. And I'll just briefly interject, Jason, before I throw it back to you there, that again, like we've said about Gobekli Tepe, I often say this uh, because it sounds ridiculously simple. We didn't know about Gobekli Tepe until we knew about Gobekli Tepe, right? Because once you discover a site like that, then, of course, it can reshape your ideas about the past. But prior to its discovery, you don't know about those things and they aren't incorporated into the body of archaeological knowledge that we have. It's, in my opinion, very likely that similar ideas could be extended to Again, ancient uh, ideas about constellations, archaeoastronomy, all these kinds of things. And briefly to Malcolm's point about statistical archaeology, again, you know, we do see a lot of statistics used with archaeology. I'd highly recommend to people if they can get a copy of David Clark's book, Analytical Archaeology. It's a bit dated, but still lays out, I think, the case very well for how, again, we can analyze data sets in archaeology and how that can be applied toward Precisely what you're doing, and really, I think a lot of uh, Malcolm's work uh, really incorporates a lot of that, too. We have so much information at our disposal these days. Many things will be left to interpretation, but we'll never unravel these keys to the ancient past unless we try. And I think it's been truly admirable work that uh, you know both of these gentlemen here have done. Guys, Jason, go ahead. Yeah, just as a, a final thought on on the discussion here, um, again, it's it's oftentimes we're looking at the symbols, at the animals, and the arrangement of such um, again, you have to put it in a, a term that makes sense when you're you're trying to break it down, looking at the clues. So if we look at Pillar 43, for example, um, Dr. Sweatman, you gave us a very good um, interpretation of what you believe could be uh, indicative of that art. But if it wasn't that, you know, my, my question is, why would you just have these miscellaneous things strewn onto a stone for no apparent reason, it's obviously meant to relay something. Uh, just as you described the supposed Scorpion King artwork um, in pre-dynastic Egypt, 
um, there would be more to it. There would be other monuments if there was truly a king who had the power and the influence in that area. So in all likelihood, it most likely is indicative of a date, of a time, of a important event. Um, because the more that we understand these things and the more that we look at them through ancient culture, the more we realize this is how they relayed information. And so I just think it's an important point when we're looking at the art at like Pillar 43, for example, that it really doesn't make sense that on this one particular uh, column that there's just miscellaneous animals strewn about. I mean, there there certainly seems to be a very deliberate um, indicate uh, indicator of something important there, something significant. And so I just I, I wanted to uh, kind of make that point so that everyone understands um, who's listening that you know these things need to be interpreted. And and one more point that I'll, I'll leave and, and end with this is. We talk about the discipline of archaeology. We talk about the discipline of, of other sciences. But as we're moving forward with technology, things like LIDAR, underwater exploration, drones, all the things that are available to us now, I think we need to consider and in the future see more multidisciplinary scientists working on sites like Gobekli Tepe, geologists, uh, biologists, environmental DNA analysis, all of these type of different people coming together because I think you can begin to paint a more holistic picture when you don't have tunnel vision of or only looking for certain types of artifacts or certain types of interpretation. So I think the work that you've done, Dr. Swetman, as far as breaking down some of the symbology and looking at it through a wider lens rather than just through the lens of archaeology is extremely important, not only at Gobekli Tepe, but at other sites throughout the world. Um, and I hope in the future that this continues to be um, the trend where people are coming together and using more than one type of interpretation. Dr. Swetman, my last question for you. If yeah. Gobekli Tepe was an ancient observatory, what might be the lasting significance of that site and the possible astronomical correlations? What does that mean for future generations, including ourselves? Well, good question. Um, and I think... One of the reasons why I really wanted to, to do something and say something about this rather than just, you know, say, well, maybe it's true and I'll just keep it to myself. The reason I want, wanted to say something publicly was because it tells us something about our cosmic environment, uh, which is important. And, um, you know, only, only 50 years ago, it was assumed uh, Earth didn't suffer cosmic impacts at all, more frankly. Um, we didn't know how many asteroids there were. We didn't know about the the number of comets or potential comets in the outer solar system. And so it seemed like um, you know, the, the likelihood that the Earth could suffer cosmic impacts was, was too small to worry about. Well, now we know different. Now we know there are many, many asteroids. I mean, and we're starting now to see that there are thousands, millions, maybe tens of millions of large um, objects in the outer solar system that have the potential to be comets and, and cause uh, chaos on Earth. So, you know, I think um, I think that the, sort of the lasting impact and the, the real reason why I wanted to say something was because it tells us that there's another risk that we need to take into account. Excellent. Thank you for being our guest on this special edition of the Seven Ages Audio Journal. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. What a catch, Jason, getting Martin Sweatman. What a fantastic guest. What an interesting perspective he provides on all this. You know, you had sent along his papers, and, you know, we all took the deep dive. Again, some of his theories are, in the archaeological community, a bit controversial. But then again, here on Seven Ages, when have we not courted controversy? And I think we always attempt to do it in a very responsible way. And I think that really Dr. Swetman's perspectives were great. You know, he, in fact, uh, is a guy who I think offers maybe in a lot of ways fresh perspectives 
in the current debate with relation, of course, to the enduring enigma of the YDH, the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis. Well, as we've discussed before, when you're dealing with something as enigmatic and mysterious as we, and I hate to just throw those words around, but those are appropriate for Gobekli Tepe because we simply don't know that much about it. And, and it's really, in the scheme of things, it's an oddity. Uh, it's very unusual, and therefore it requires some out-of-the-box thinking. And there's nothing wrong with that because the more that you think about things, the more ideas that you put out there, the more things that you bounce off of other people, the more you begin to figure these things out. We've seen that happen throughout ancient Egypt, uh, ancient Greece, all of these areas of archaeology that have been established for longer longer periods of time. Uh, you have to do that to a certain degree. And as long as you do it responsibly, as long as you do it in a scientific way, um, again, like Dr. Sweatman said, you know, none of this is gospel. He said these are potential ideas. These are theories. These are things that we're thinking about as we're looking at this mystery. And there's nothing wrong with that. And I think here at Seven Ages, we uh, try to do that, like you said, responsibly. You know, we don't just take any uh, idea that comes along and, and put it on the show, but we do it in a responsible way. Uh, but some of these ideas need to be explored a little bit further and a little bit more in depth. And again, as the research comes up over the years and technology it gets better, we'll begin to you know sort some of these things out. But we've got a long way to go at Gobekli Tepe, and we're really at the beginning of understanding what it's all about, what it means, and as the excavations continue in coming years, we'll add that much more to the narrative. Yeah, exactly. You know, the one thing that's missing from the equation, though, is the realistic time frame in terms of when we'll be able to really get back out there. With the pandemic, it has really hampered our ability to do a whole lot of traveling. I really am missing getting out there traveling, not just in the United States, but to other countries. And in fact, Gobekli Tepe, Egypt, so many other places, Stonehenge, you know, these are all on the list. And for as long as we are unable to be out there on site, as we have often prided ourselves in doing and being able to observe on the ground, speak with the experts, and get a serious feel for the sites and their history, we have to kind of operate within what we might call the theater of the mind. I appropriate that from the early days of radio, but it certainly applies to what we do right here on the Seven Ages Audio Journal. And so, James, Jason, I think before we pony up over here at the bar and have one more round, let's raise one. Well, the one that we have in our hand right now. Let's finish this one off at least with, of course, a recognition for where we are on our way to. We've come a long way with this podcast. We have come a long way as team civilization throughout time. I look forward to many more adventures. The greatest, my friends, as always, are yet to come. So what do you say? Why don't we pony up over here and enjoy one more round, huh? Now I'll meet you at the bar. Indeed. I look forward to it. Well, on behalf of James Waldo, Jason Pentrail, and yours truly, Micah Hanks, we are the Seven Ages Research Associates. We look forward to the next round. And, of course... Digging deeper, as always, into history. So we'll talk to you guys again next time, my friends. It is the Seven Ages Audio Journal. Onward, forward, and deeper, as always, my friends. <laughs> <laughs>